Hi everybody, my name is Lisa, this is my corner, you're very welcome, thank you for joining me. Um, today I am going to be talking about some books because Christmas is coming and you may have some wishes and wants on your list or you might have somebody you want to buy for. So I have a few recommendations, a bit of a pile, uh, from the practical to the absolute self-indulgence. So the first one I'm going to start, start with is the practical. In terms of um, understanding art, its history, its, its creation, its roots, um, the big figures, the smaller figures, the, um, the new and the different. So it's called Art, the whole story is produced by Tenzin Hudson. I think this was 25, yeah, 1995 at Waterstones. Right, so art history, why? you may ask, because I think it's important to be able to, say, read a picture, to understand the influences, the, um, <clears throat> the stories and the processes behind a painting, what an artist has brought to a painting, what we can learn, um, I think, and it's something that's going to go through all of this. Sometimes for me, if I get stuck, if I'm feeling a bit about either a painting or something I'm working on or a direction, sometimes it's great to pick up and look at and study a copy of an old master or a modern piece or whatever, and to look and see what they've done, either composition, brushwork, just their inspiration, the way they've used a color, light, design, and so on and so forth. We have a lot to learn from the past, from, from the present. And uh, it, it, the more informed you are, the more resources you have to draw on, I think the richer, the richer your work is going to be. So here we go, the whole thing. And it does, it starts at prehistory. Uh, so cave paintings. But the wonderful thing about this particular book is it's not entirely centered on Western art. It's so right back in time. It starts with, yeah, cave paintings, but it also talks about early Colombian art. Knew nothing about it, very interesting. Of course, the Greeks, of course, the Egyptians, but then West African art from the Middle Age. Um, Nigeria, you know, a revelation. I mean, Picasso took African masks and it sort of inspired a new level of his abstractions. But and from there, from there it, it moved into, became more, more visible. The, the elongation, the the larger eyes and all the rest of it. Was it cultural appropriation? I don't really know. Hmm, it's an interesting question. Anyway, the sacred art. So Hindu, um, Islamic art, uh, different tapestry, different forms of art, Chinese art, calligraphy, painting on silk, uh, Korean art, the Bayou tapestry, 14th century, Korean art. Again, unbeknownst to me, in, a diversity in here that I'd never, I think if you were to try and collect all of these eras and movements, you'd spend a lot of time reading, but this is a great place to start. Now, the other thing that this book does, and I'm going to take two, one example, because this is like one of my favourite, favourite paintings and most interesting and well for me it's most interesting and an interesting painter Titian and it's Bax and Ariadne. So I'm going to use this painting with the light shining on it just to give you an example of how this book works. So Bacchus and Ariadne. Ariadne has been so Greek mythology. There's a lot going on. When this was created I suppose people of a certain level of education. The people who commissioned this, for instance, this was commissioned by the 
Duke of Ferrara for his his palace and he obviously he wants this to show off all his knowledge and how erudite he is and how well read um, and of course this is Renaissance so the painters are using they're throwing back to Greek mythology old old sources of it Catalyst who told these stories Bacchus and Ariadne Ariadne has been abandoned by Theseus on Naxos after she's helped him okay to escape from the Minotaur and the labyrinth and this is what happens so word of warning girls don't be trusting fellas to get out of labyrinths because they'll only run off and leave you on an island Bacchus appears they fall in love all's fabulous uh, Bacchus has appeared out of the woods with all his disreputable types Bacchus is also Dionysus Dionysus the god of wine general good times so over here this very, 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 there's a lot going on here. Very complicated picture. Focal points have been taken and explained in more detail, as well as over here, there's, a, there's an overview of, of the painting. There's also discussion over here about the um, Titian himself, materials that are used. So there's a discussion about lapis lazuli that's been used as the blue, the vibrant blue in this painting. Um, so, out of one painting, an awful lot is broken down and explained. And I think they're also, it's a sort of a starting off point for more examination, more thinking, more reading. And uh, it's like a taster. So that for me, and right, so I haven't finished yet. Because all the way up to modern art, I think it ends with Anthony Gormley or somebody Yes, Anthony Gormley, no sorry, Grayson Perry and his uh, ceramics is the last person in here. I think this is a great book as well if you lack confidence about what's going on in a painting or particularly modern painting which can be very intimidating and which people can go oh I don't understand it. This, this is a great help. And it breaks it down to the different movements and, um, you know, th there was painters in here I'd never heard of that um, I've gone off and done, done more research on modern painters, modern artists. So, Jacob Epstein, brilliant. If you want to give yourself a bit of a, a, a head start or a, a dive into some things, this book is fantastic. Now, there's a place I want to discuss. This book is by, is Kenneth Clark. If anybody, is that, is that the Kenneth Clark? I don't know, but anyway, it's, again, it, it's a similar concept. 100 details from the National Gallery. So they've taken, this is a Botticelli, Mars and Venus, I think. Again, focused in on um, old masters and discussed what's going on in these paintings oh look look people look oh, those beaut beautiful faces those beautiful beautiful faces oh my word look so you have a chance to examine really closely some of the beautiful pieces in um in one of the most famous galleries in the world. Um, now, I got this secondhand. There's a wonderful book shop in Canterbury on the High Street going towards the cathedral. Um, and at the back, there is a stack of art books. So I had a good rummage. So I got this and I also got this. Um, I think this was a catalogue to go with, or like a guide to go with an exhibition um, at the the Tate of the Impressionists in London. Um, beautiful thing. I mean, these were like seven or six pounds each, um, and I've read them and I've gone back to them. I got them in the summer, and I have just, I've just not put them down. Now, the thing about this this book. It opens up and examines in really, really good detail. 
a moment in a time within a movement, within the Impressionist movement. They've all had to escape to London because of the Communard rising, like the Franco-Prussian War is part of it, and then the rising, the, the rising of the Communards in Paris and um, chaos, absolute chaos. So lots of, lots and lots and lots of, um, it's like, I think, so out of this period, particularly this painting, Monet's studies of the Thames and the Houses of Parliament, John Sink uh, Whistler is in here, um, Sicily, Pizarro, I think, in his paintings around Dulwich and Norwood of all places. So this is beautiful, luscious, fantastic book from a second. So if you're in Canterbury, oops, go and have a look. Highly recommend it. Amazing little place for a route and a rummage. Listen, I've been a really good YouTuber today. I've got two candles lit, but their names are too rude to be pronounced here. So I'm enjoying their scents. <laughs> Diversion. It's so dark here. Storm Barrett is moving in and it's almost like midnight. So I thought I'd light some candles. I don't know what difference they're going to make in a storm. But anyway, they make me feel cosy. Next. Again, sort of secondhand books, but um, a, a set of a library that I, I didn't know existed. So this is Fiden, Fiden Colour Library. I bought one about <laughs> Manet. So I could finally learn the difference and confidently pronounce Monet and Manet. I know the difference because so I just keep getting because I'm such a genius. Anyway, this is the Manet one and this was 6 95 Now, lovely reproductions in here. Again, each painting, you have time to study it. There's a little piece about it, little discussion and you can look at your, uh, your leisure. Then, so, right, let me show you. There is a whole collection of these. So people like Holbein, the Italian Renaissance painting, Bruegel, Frangelico, they're all in here. And for the price, Schiller, Sicily, for the price that they are, they're fantastic. So I got the Bonnard one as well. It's somebody who I have always wanted to find out more about and find out more about. He's such an interesting character and his work seemed to have gone through such a metamorphosis from such a young, you know, from so very clear and then just to sort of all this light and windows, <laughs> for instance. And his years in the south of France, I could go on. So there's those. Now I got that second one, I got this second hand off Amazon. And um, I'm going to be looking into more. There's those. I'd highly recommend them if you are particularly interested in in one artist. Now, so for Manet, we go to Monet. These two, Vienna 1900 and Monet. These are Taschen. Again, I bought these secondhand on Amazon. I think I got the pair of them for £18. This one is wonderful, beautiful reproductions of his paintings. Again, somebody again liked that palette. The, the different inspirations. The thing about Monet that I think appeals to me the most is that he, you know, his life was a struggle. We know him as this beautiful, seemingly effortless lilies um, on his beautiful garden and hot. Thusly, all of those, you know, take one look at it, you know it's a money. Unless you're me, you call it money. But anyway, you take one look and you know it's it's money. He's everywhere. He's ubiquitous at this stage. But his early life was not was no walk in the garden. <laughs> no walk in the park. He struggled. He had to work very hard. Um, <clears throat> so it's well worth remembering that this wonderful the text in it is really good the discussion of the paintings the different um aspects of his 
working life and so on and so forth um, and what made him the brilliant artist that he is um, however this Vienna 1900 as you can see it's quite a slim book could you think of a more exciting time in art, in architecture, jewellery, design? We get the start of the Art Deco. Like for instance, you know, I look at, I look at what, I'm just going to look at this. It's so, so modern and I start to think of Charles Rennie Mackintosh. Oscar Wilde, uh, everybody's in here, Klimt, uh, Oscar Kokoschka, um, uh, Egon Schiller, the naughty naughty boy, he's in here, the um, Mahler, his wife, she was a bit of a one, and again obviously the big boy himself, Klimt, with the lady on the front, Beautiful reproductions of the paintings and the work. However, what I discovered, this is the English edition. Now, as I started reading this, I just, I was like, um, this, this is like ploughing through treacle. It, it didn't, it was such an effort to read. I stopped after half an hour and the thought occurred to me this wasn't written in English and I think it's been really poorly translated so be careful I think be careful if you're buying it to read it as much as to look at the pictures or to use the pictures take a bit of time and be careful about um, what edition it is because the text on this was very disappointing reproductions are lovely but I was dying to get into reading about this and all the different characters and people and you know what Vienna 1900 and there's 95 pages yeah it's 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 sort of skipped over stuff but you know what as a starting place it's not bad but um I I think I think I'm going to look for something a bit more a bit more meat on its bones. Now, last but certainly not least, I'd like to give a British, a British more, more specifically a Welsh artist a shout out. This is Sir Kiffin Williams. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And he is a Welsh artist. He was born in Anglesey. I first saw his paintings actually on a documentary by David Dimbleby on the art of the British Isles. So it was my birthday recently, I got some birthday money and I got this. His work is something to behold. Um, and it, the, the theme is the Welsh landscape largely. There's some portraiture, but the, the quality of the light, the mountains, small houses. <laughs> it's a heavy book, I'm just busting myself in the face small houses against sort of quite bleak backgrounds um a little snapshot of everything this was i got it on amazon i think i paid like 20 something pounds for it uh, just again taking somebody else's work to nourish yourself in a way is and to spend time studying their their brushwork, the progress of their work over a lifetime's work is worth it. Now the other thing that I've that these books do for me is means I I can galleries, okay? Galleries can be a bit tiresome, can be a bit of a trial for me. Um you know, pandemic has made it, I mean, I wouldn't really right now, I wouldn't go into a gallery. <clears throat> the last, the last exhibition I went to see was the um, Pre-Raphaelites and the Raphaelite Brotherhood at Tate. And 
it was so so off-putting listen i'm not great with crowds and i've discussed the bipolarity and stuff like that before my you know uh sort of like bit of bit of agoraphobia don't like crowds i can feel quite stressed out quite quickly but this thing was rammed so there were timed groups going in so <clears throat> like it was like 20 minutes 20 every 25 minutes there was a new group going in and there was crowds and crowds and crowds of people so you didn't get time to spend any time with the paintings um there would be like two or three deep in front of each piece so i quite honestly raced around it i think it was 18 pounds for the ticket ran through it and just wanted to get out and i didn't enjoy it so in a way some of these books allow me the time to to study and to it's not the same as looking at the piece in situ but they certain they, they'll just they, they allow me to avoid some of that um to me very nightmarish i mean the thoughts of the national gallery on a on a on a term day um where you've got several groups of school children or or students or whatever it is milling around not interested and uh not their fault you know i'm sure most of them don't want to be there but they're being dragged through for a bit of culture to be bashed into them yeah that it's a nightmare and uh I, you, you know it's so ungrateful of me because i live in a city with some of the most incredible and extensive collections in the world and i sit here moaning so <clears throat> i have to i have to balance out that I've just been a bit a bit spoiled but anyway that's everything i hope there's something in there for you something to think about something to um to start a thought a thought pattern or you know or find a nice present for yourself or somebody else and uh yeah so thank you for joining me um if you have any recommendations if there's something in your art library that is the the meaning for your existence do let me know i'm always looking for new things got other stuff up there but these i've been on a bit of a spend up lately so i hopefully i get some more for christmas and come back in the new year and I'll, I'll share my christmas haul with you so again thank you for dropping by come and see me again and take care for now bye bye